Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In woods at the eastern edge of Edwardsville, Illinois, the incident occurred in June. In three separate incidents, three residents reported seeing and being chased by a musty-odored, red-eyed, human-sized creature or monster. The creature was described as 5 feet 8 inches tall, broad-shouldered, with red eyes that cannot stand light. It makes no sound, even when it walks. One male described to police an incident in which it ripped his shirt and scratched his chest. Reports described the creature as lurking in the woods. It was a wooded area near Mooney, Little Mooney, and Sugar Creeks. On to the next one. In Randolph County in Illinois, I have never told anyone this except my husband, who never did believe me. He knows something happened, but he can't wrap his mind around the possibility for fear of ridicule. I was alone when this occurred, and I am finally reporting this incident so many years later, more for my own peace of mind than for anything else. This memory is as clear today as it was the day it happened, and still makes the back of my neck hair stand on end. Perhaps it will allow someone else to know that others are out there who have had an experience that can't be easily explained. This happened in southern Illinois, outside the small rural community of Prairie du Rocher, a town that is over 200 years old. There is a great deal of wooded area, especially along the bluff. Large tree stands that follow along the Mississippi River and somewhat inland in very thick stands between the Illinois and Missouri Bluffs, on up to the tops of the bluffs on both sides. It is a sparsely populated area. There is a great deal of wildlife there. A huge deer population exists, and they are big and fat from all the corn and wheat fields. At the time of this incident, we had horses which were being kept at a farm about three miles away from our house. Up on top of the bluff, on 17 acres of fenced pasture, surrounded by woodland and cornfields. The land had a pond and several sinkholes, one which was present across from the old original French house, which was vacant. The particular sinkhole was approximately six feet deep in the center, tapering up to about two feet along the edges. The inside of the hole had a profuse growth of young oak, maple, and other hardwood trees that were approximately four to five years old and about 20 feet tall. The trees stood exposed out of the sinkhole at a minimum of 12 to 14 feet in height. The barn sat to the right of the house about 300 yards away and the horses were standing nearby. I had come up in late afternoon, probably sometime after 7 p.m. to the farm to feed and check on my two horses, and had planned to make camp between the house and the sinkhole and spend the night. I did not want to stay inside the house because of the fear of spiders and snakes. My husband had gone for the weekend, and I wanted to get up early the next morning to go riding. I had my German Shepherd dog with me. I built my fire and put bacon on to fry and made a small pot of coffee. As the bacon was starting to sizzle inside my skillet, I heard an odd grunt come from inside the sinkhole area close to the edge that was toward me, which was at this point approximately 10 to 12 feet away from me. My dog was always ready to chase deer or any other animal away, but all he did at this time was stand close to me. Then he started to shake violently. He wouldn't leave my side. I stood up and stared at the trees in the sinkhole. I had no weapon on me. It was nearly dark by this time, and the sound came again, but this time 
It was a very, very loud screech, almost a scream so close I instinctively held my ears. My first thoughts were, did a bobcat smell my food or a coyote? My mind was trying to rationalize the sound before I realized it was much too loud and strange for either animal to have made. Then, many of the trees began to violently shake back and forth, accompanied with more of the grunting, screeching, high and low growl sounds. I can't explain it any other way. It was as if someone or something had grabbed the trees in anger, shaking them hard and rapid. I think in order to frighten me off, there was little to no wind, only a slight mild breeze. Everything felt silent around me. My horses had come out of the barn. They had stopped feeding and were now staring at the sinkhole. I heard them stomp and snort before they turned and ran off at a fast gallop, as if startled by a predator. I saw them from the corner of my eye, but I kept watching the trees. I admit, I was fascinated, but there was a creeping sense of fear that filled me. Then the trees stopped moving. There was a faint, odd smell in the air that didn't last long, and I did not recognize. I only caught a whiff of it, but I remember thinking how odd it was. Silence for maybe five seconds before another long snort or grunt sound came out from them. I didn't move. It was like I was rooted to that spot. The dog didn't move either. Then the trees started to shake again. The thing that got me was this time many of them were being shaken very hard. So many it boggled my mind. It just shouldn't have been possible. It just shouldn't be possible. I can tell you that the fear I felt then was unbelievable and it finally got me into action. I doused the fire and threw the hot skillet with the bacon still sizzling into the back of my pickup, got my dog, and we left. I was still so frightened when I got to my home that I opened the outside cellar door and threw the skillet down the steps, grease, bacon, and all. I wasn't able to clean things up for a couple of days afterward. The cellar floor was dirt, and most of the grease had been soaked up when I finally was able to clean the pan up. I know it sounds stupid, but I had been traumatized. Please know that I had been up at that farm many times, all alone, riding, feeding, grooming my animals, and was never afraid before. I never felt any fear from anything. I loved it. I would see many animals on my rides, and I loved the woods. After this incident, however, it changed my life. It scared me so much that we sold the horses and I stayed out of the woods. I've never been back in any woods or isolated place again. I didn't want to know what that was and never wanted to experience any of it ever again. Now, after all these years, I've never forgotten, nor have I spoke about it. This is the first time, and I think from the length of this, you can tell I'm still shaken up by the whole thing. Irrational? Yeah, I probably think so. Looking back on it, I still remember how I felt. I still remember every detail. By the way, there was no mountain lion or bears in southern Illinois at that time. Still, not that I know of, not where we lived anyway. Really, no predator bigger than a bobcat. So, what was this? Even if there had been some type of larger predator, what could it have been to have moved so many trees at one time and make that god-awful noise. I do believe there was some incident during the same month and year reported in counties adjacent to Randolph, both top and lower. My husband and I both heard at that time. It was in the papers, even the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I did not say anything to him about my experience. It was only years later after we moved out to Arizona, that I finally told him. It was after the Finding Bigfoot show came on, which he does not watch, but I do because I didn't feel so silly telling him after that, but I could tell he still didn't believe me. So I'm telling you. The original sighting was about 7.30 to 8 p.m. in a heavily wooded area. 
water source nearby, natural creek, thick brushy forest of oak, walnut, maple, hickory, and other hardwood trees. On to the next one. I was recovering at home from a broken leg, and my wife Patty suggested that now would be a good time to go through the old steamer trunk left to me when my last living relative was gone. I had been avoiding doing this for several years, but I knew I couldn't put it off any longer. Having tried this once before, I had quit when it became too tearful, as I had lost all contact for so many years. It seemed as if a major part of my life had gone on without me. While Patty kept me supplied with snacks and beverages, I made pretty fast work of the old newspapers and family photos, the majority of the latter, showing people I couldn't remember. And then I found the old diary. It had been handed down from my great-grandfather, who was born into the family's business of the manufacture of military weaponry and munitions. Most of the diary's entries were rather mundane when describing the details of his duties and details of his daily life, until I came upon a notation that just stood out like it was in light. The comment began, heading out for a couple of days with some friends to Smith's Island, and then he had drawn a line through Smith's and written, Guess I should be calling it Oak Island now, since the cartographer made the last change before they started selling lots again. I would never have paid the inked-out name any attention had I not watched the television program on the Oak Island treasure hunt a couple of days before. I yelled out for Patty to come in, and we both sat stunned as searching on her laptop revealed that Oak Island had indeed gone through various name changes due to multiple owners, cartographers' whims, and property designers disputing each other's choices. Add to this discovery the fact that Grandfather was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and it was indisputable truth that my great-grandfather had actually camped on that same Oak Island. Now, Patty and I were reading the diary together great-grandfather made detailed comments of their campsite, and he elaborated enough that we had the feeling that relaxation such as this came seldom back in those times. Then, things changed. The next observations were written so we could almost feel the tension he was experiencing as he referred to two large and gangly-haired bush apes. He went on to say, these apes were down beside the skiff and trying to tear it loose from the mooring when we came running down the sloping bank, yelling and throwing rocks. The distance to the shore was about 200 meters, and these creatures swam it in only a couple of minutes, and although we had seen many of them before, none of us knew they could swim. Then we saw their secret. They had been hanging on to a short piece of log, which the waters in the area were virtually littered with from all the timber harvesting operations. After a short description of the rest of his rather normal outing, it ended. That was my great-grandfather's last entry, as a few days later, he was killed along with 2,000 other people on December 6, 1917, when the French ammunition ship SS Montblanc collided with SS Emo, a Norwegian steamship in Halifax Harbor. The large diary also contained several old photographs that were glued on the pages, and there was great-granddad in a photo earlier in 1917 seated beside Franklin Delano Roosevelt, with a notation, packed meeting with Franklin D. Roosevelt, Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Navy. All this time, I had never known anything about my great-grandfather, and here he was with my nine-year-old grandfather sitting on his lap beside the future president of the United States of America. Turning the page, I saw that my grandfather had a note on the page saying he wished to honor his father 
by continuing to use this diary to record family history. Then, with the World War and the family's company in the munitions business, the diary must have sat a while before he made any further entries. Judging from the dates, Grandfather Roland must have waited for a fair number of years before he began recording his own follow-up, of which I was perusing the rather mundane record of his weekly activities when my eyes again focused on the word Oak Island. There was Grandfather's notation. Had a run-in with one of those apes today. They seem to come out of the deep woods at dusk and hunt. Don't know all what they eat, but fruits for sure, and potatoes. Farmers around here are losing some small critters like cats, goats, and sheep. I met one near Smith's Cove on my very rare time off, so I was not prepared to give way. A few shouts and waving of fists, coupled with it being smaller than I, caused it to lurch off into the woods. Constable Chruthers and our game management team will hold a meeting to study this increasing problem, and an attempt to study this creature will be discussed with the CCCWP. I later looked up this abbreviation Grandfather made and learned it stood for the Cross Canadian Council for Wildlife Protection. That was Grandfather's last note, and the book became a casualty with no further entries. My father evidently had decided not to continue the family records, but this was part of my family that I found too late to have anyone left to ask questions of. Guess I'll never know. On to the next one. This happened to me when I was hunting in northern Idaho. I am an expert tracker. My father had taught me early on the fundamentals of tracking game while we hunted together and is the case with many things in life, I'd caught on to what he had shown me and taken it to the next level. Even my father was amazed with my abilities to track and follow game through the wilderness. I only mention this because, as you will soon hear, this ability of mine actually led me to another hunter and what was found. I was on the hunt on this particular day and had run upon the tracks of another hunter, who, based on the freshness of what I was looking at, had just passed through this area only a short while before me. This in and of itself was an extremely rare occasion. Not only that someone would be exactly where I was when I was there, but that I had actually never seen another hunter in this area, period. So I decided to have a little fun and track the tracker. For someone like me, tracking someone with lug sole boots on is extremely easy. And I was working my way in deep, getting turned around once or twice, but I was hot on its trail. At some point, a second set of tracks appeared, which were entering in behind this tracker's, and they were those of a mountain lion. As I moved forward, these lion tracks were staying with the hunters, and so I knew that I was tracking a lion that was tracking a hunter. This was a worst-case scenario for someone even of my skill level, and my heart began to race. Unless you were sitting or moving in a way where you had the ability to see 360 degrees clearly, this hunter, who was somewhere ahead of me, would have no idea this big cat was behind him until it got the jump on him, and I was really worried. I doubled my pace in pursuit of the hunter and this cat, as well as occasionally shouting in the hopes of this hunter hearing me, as well as tripping up this cat's pursuit of him. It must have been about a mile later, and these tracks were still running along together as I was beginning to fear the worst, when I decided to discharge a round into the air, which I did. Perhaps another thousand yards or so, I caught a glimpse of a cat moving along a bluff to my north, and when I had gotten further up the track, I saw that the pursuit had been broken, and the cat I saw must have been the one. I took a deep sigh of relief, thinking to myself, I should have fired the round sooner. Lesson learned. About twenty minutes later, ahead of me, I saw the other hunter making his way down through a rocky crag, 
and heading back in my direction. I moved forward to meet him. Finally, when we were face to face, he told me that he had heard my shot ring out, and I told him that he was being tailed by a lion. He was actually very grateful, saying that I may have saved his butt that day, and immediately told me that I might as well have a look at what he just found. The conversation kind of petered off, and the intensity of his walk and overall demeanor told me there was something very wrong, and I was about to find out what it was. The two of us were struggling back through this crag when he stopped and pointed. I couldn't believe my eyes, and yet, as we moved even closer, what I now saw was even worse. It was the body of a backpacker shoved in between a couple of boulders. He hadn't moved it, but the two of us together decided to try to pull it out, which we did. It was the body of a man, and the aluminum frame of his pack was crushed, virtually flat, still being on his shoulders. There was dried blood all around his face and mouth, indicative of an internal trauma of some sort, as he may have fallen from a great height to where he was. The problem being, where he was wedged when we found him had nothing overhead from which to fall. It was a rubble heap of rocks, so to speak. Going up the side of a gradual incline, he was fully clothed, and one arm was missing from his body. We looked everywhere in the area for the arm, and found nothing. Now, obviously, an arm just doesn't fall off a human being's body. It would have been torn off or cut off, but it wouldn't have fallen off. This guy, who I now knew was named Dan, was in an emotional tailspin over this find, and I couldn't blame him. It was absolutely horrific to look upon. In an effort to try to pull him out of this malaise, I tried to start a conversation about the find by asking him what he thought may have happened while postulating some scenarios of my own. At some point, he broke his silence with a deep sigh and said, I think a Bigfoot nailed this poor sucker. I stood there dumbfounded, having heard what he said. There was no damage to his clothes, and his pack rack was crushed against his body, as though something had grabbed him around the upper body and literally crushed the life out of him. It was so out of the box to look at him and the state he was in that Dan's scenario actually made sense to me. What Dan didn't know was that I had actually seen a Bigfoot, or should I say, what I believed was a Bigfoot running away from a deer which I had shot and tracked many years earlier. The two of us made our way back out, and the rest is history, as they say. The facts are these. The man had suffered some type of physical trauma, having had nowhere to fall from. Could he have been injured somewhere else and made his way to this point? Perhaps. But how far could one travel with a severe internal injury? There were also no high places, relatively speaking, from which he may have fallen. Secondly, even if he had made it to this point severely injured, he would have just dropped in his track. He certainly would not be navigating a rough boulder pile in the state he was in. Rather, he would have been staggering along on relatively level terrain before he fell to the ground. His body was tightly wedged down in this crag as if it was being hidden. So perhaps one might think some other nefarious individual or individuals may have been responsible. But then there was the crushed aluminum pack frame. No human is going to crush a man to death to the point where his organs rupture. You would hit him in the head with a rock or shoot him. And then there was the missing arm of all things. Who the heck tears an arm off their victim having murdered them? It was all too crazy for me to think about. There was also no damage to his clothing. That being coupled with the fact that there are large predators in this area, if he had been attacked by a bear or a lion, what we came across would have appeared much differently. The more I thought about it, the more I believed that Dan was correct in what he had said. I think a Bigfoot nailed this poor sucker. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe.
I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!